Um, I think uh, what it really provides is a relational lens into the organization on who the big contributors are and then who are the people that you're not getting sufficient leverage from. So what our work always shows, no matter what group we're looking at, if we compare our list of who's uh, creating the most value for others in the network and then compare that against the company's list of their top talent, there's only about a 50% overlap. So it's a fantastic way of being able to understand talent that is traditionally missed by more individualistic systems. Uh, out there and then find ways to recognize that and cultivate that talent. Uh, secondarily, it's also a great way of seeing who's on the fringe of the network that you're not getting a sufficient leverage from and finding ways to alter onboarding processes or career planning mechanisms or other things like that that help you to get greater utilization from the people that you're not uh, getting as much uh, success from in the moment. Finally, the last thing that we tend to see from an HR standpoint or talent standpoint are companies that are profiling what the top performers networks look like and then finding ways to embed that into various talent mechanisms, onboarding, uh, career development, uh, succession planning, things that help and take the network very seriously given the impact it has on each person's performance but helping others to replicate those dimensions as well. So the biggest thing I'm finding right now with leaders is that they need to find ways to decrease collaborative demands. Um, if we just go to leaders and say you need to have these three dimensions built into your network, most of them roll their eyes and say they're too busy uh, at the end of the day. So the first step for us is always finding very structural and then behavioral means of driving down collaborative demands. Then we look for different opportunities to improve uh, how their network is affecting performance and well-being. So the bridging ties in networks, ties across functions functions, across expertise domains, across hierarchy, those are all important to establish in networks for various reasons and of course we're interested in then building networks that lead to uh, greater effectiveness on projects. Then we also focus uh, in terms of building connectivity to people that have an influence on balance or work-life integration. So what we see in terms of the leaders that are resilient and thriving today is that they have at least one and usually two things they're doing with other people outside of work that have meaning for them. So this can be athletic related, it can be uh, mental engagement kinds of hobbies, it can be either uh, philanthropy, religion, a range of different things, but it's really critical uh, for leaders to not become unidimensional and not to allow too much of what they care about to be wed into the organization over time, we find. The last thing we see is the more resilient and happy leaders uh, have a much greater tendency to manage the negative interactions at work better. So rather than dwell on them, they find different ways of shifting away from toxic interactions or at least reframing how they react to those people over time. Uh, if we look at those things in aggregate, um, by morphing a network to these dimensions, we see huge impacts around performance uh, for the leaders, but also really significant gains in terms of just more broadly how happy they are. Are they thriving? Are they resilient uh, at 